it is a great thing to stand in awe of the awesome presence of God. And the Bible tells us that um, someday, probably not real far away, uh, we're going to be in his presence, and that will last forever. And uh, we will know the idea of what awesome really is when we're with him. This summer we've been studying through a series, Don't Panic. Um, the series is on called Stress Fractures, or things that, um, that cause stress for us as we live our lives. And I'm kind of doing that during the summer because each one is sort of different from the other. So if you pop in and pop out, you're really not missing anything. And uh, the one today is really uh, significant because it's going to speak to the heart of the individual. Each individual here, I hope, and each one of us need to think in these terms. There's a cause and effect, and it's guaranteed. This, this is guaranteed to be true. Stress does not necessarily make you defiant, but defiance will always bring you stress. Yeah, we're going to talk about the area of defiance today. That is where your heart says, with a straight arm pushed out toward God, you just say, no, I'm not going there. I'm not going to do that. That's not me. That's not what I'm all about. And uh, that's just the attitude of being opposed to what God would want us to do in our lives. And I, and I know that we can have stress in our life every day, whether the, uh, the bills are piling up or the schedule is overflowed or, or what it is. And that stress can be very, very difficult to deal with. But that stress does not necessarily have to make you defiant toward God and everybody else. It may burn you out. It may make you exhausted. It may do all kinds of things. But it's not going to make you a defiant, uh, rebellious individual. However, guaranteed, guaranteed, you become a defiant, rebellious individual, you will be stressed out. <laughs> it will happen. It may not happen the first moment that you stomp your foot and say, no, I won't. But eventually, you're fighting against something where you're swimming upstream and everybody else is swimming, swimming downstream. Now, by the, word, by the way, the word defiant, uh, I haven't been able to find that exact word in Scripture. There may be a version that you have that translates it that way, but it's not necessarily there in its own form in, in the Bible, in the original languages. However... Uh, there is no shortage of examples of defiance in the scriptures. Defiance is sometimes overlooked in our society. Um, we tend to ignore it. Sometimes in the classroom, when little Johnny or little Mary are just acting up or whatever for the one millionth time this month, maybe the teacher will finally just say, you know, I've had enough, but I'm just going to ignore them from now on. And that could be, and I'm not blaming the teacher for that at all. That can happen. Boy, in our culture, don't we, I listen to sports stuff a lot on the radio when I'm driving around, and don't we see nothing but rebellion, nothing but defiance in people. You know, a guy says, I won't go to practice, but he'll hold a press conference doing push-ups in his driveway. I mean, you know, we just, anything that's different, that slices differently, and so all, our, all the people who are seeing that as models are all of a sudden it's really cool to be different. The other night I was watching um, uh, Fox Sports late at night. I just put it on. And uh, they had the 50 most bizarre moments in sports. And every one of them, I only saw the last five, which I assume was the best, number five up to number one. And every one of them had some picture of rebellion, whether it was Nolan Ryan getting that guy in the headlock and punching him a few times, or when it was Mike Tyson biting off the knee or two, and um, not corn. Um, but, you know, just all kinds of stuff that is just bizarre and crazy, and it's, it's a clear indication that there is a problem with the person's heart. No, we don't need to do a calf, and there's not a bypass necessarily in the in the um, making here, but there's something absolutely wrong with the heart. And, and, you know, we will wink at that, and we'll talk about the athlete who did something really cool and stupid, and wow, wasn't that neat, that was so sharp, and we kind of ignore that to a degree, but I guarantee you, 
If you have defiance in your life before God, he will never, ever ignore that. <laughs> you can't get away with that one. You can't rebel against God and think, well, you know, he understands me. That's just the way I am. It's not going to happen. In fact, God predicted that in this day and age, which I think it's this day and age that we're living in, that, um, that this was going to happen. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, you can read that later, it just talks about in the latter times, in the times when, the, when history is winding down to when Christ is going to return, there's going to be all sorts of rebellion that's going on, and people are not going to pay any attention to godly things, but they're going to be in rebellion against that. They may do religious things and feel good about themselves, but they're not going to be doing the thing that God wants us to do. I don't ever get to watch this. I just don't. I'm never home at the right time. But when I do, it's, it's entertaining to me to turn on the TV and for two minutes watch a TV court show, you know, where so-and-so is suing so-and-so because they did whatever. And it's like, that is so amazing to see that. And all those shows have a couple things in common. They all have, well, obviously lawlessness. <laughs> Somebody did something wrong or else they wouldn't be there. They all have high pressure because there's, you know, you just sense it. Everybody's nervous and anger, a lot of anger going on there. I don't think they would have gotten to the point where they went on TV or into another situation like that unless there was some real anger. I was reading a study the other day that said compared to 10 years ago, Ten years ago is not a long, well, maybe if you're nine years old, it was a long time ago. But for me, it wasn't that long ago, ten years ago. I can actually remember that. Ten years ago, or some things about it, from today compared to ten years ago, there's been some changes, and obviously a lot of changes. But one of them that was studied was your chances of being a victim of a crime compared to ten years ago, they've doubled. You have doubled your chance of being a victim of a... Congratulations, by the way. Um, and we know that's true because we can watch on television and, and see the news and there's all kinds of things going on around the world. But even in our little world, where um, all of a sudden we have disasters, huge disasters, hurricanes. We even name them pretty names like Katrina. And they come through and they wipe out areas and we send the National Guard in not to rescue people off boats and off islands, but to shoot the people who are shooting each other because they're stealing from each other. <laughs> and it's like, what is wrong with the human heart? I think we know. Want to hear God's commentary on defiance? This is found in Romans chapter 1. And I'm actually going to read from verse 28 onward. Uh, to verse 32. I'm just going to read it to you. If you don't find it, that's okay. It says, furthermore, now you know Paul's talking about just the, uh, the ugly sin that people love to pursue. And um, verse 28 then says, furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. Okay, people want sin, don't want God. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. God finally reaches a point where he says, you know what, if that is your heart, if you are so bent on being rebellious and just having your own way, then guess what? I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to let you just go ahead and do whatever you want to do. I think parents have done that on occasion, probably all of us probably have, where it's like, you know what, if you're going to do this stupid thing, go ahead. You know, just make your day. Have fun with it. If you come home smellier, dirtier, whatever, or scratched, then that's your problem. And that's kind of what God said, although when we're dealing with it in real life, with God, those smells and dirts and scratches are huge, the way they damage us. And God said, go ahead, go for it. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They invent ways of doing evil and you see it all the time they disobey their parents they're senseless faithless heartless ruthless although they know god's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death they not only continue to do these very things but also approve of those 
who practice them. It's like, not only do I want to do the stupid, horrible, grotesque things that I want to do, when I hear somebody else who does it bigger and better than me, I put them on TV. I make a talk show out of it, or a reality show, or whatever I can make out of it, because that's so cool. Because if they can get away with what they get away with, then I can get away with what I get away with. At least in human terms, get away with it. And God says, we all know that this stuff is wrong. We all know it deserves death. And yet we pursue it anyhow. And in the meantime, I, I think a lot of people, as I said this once years ago, I think a lot of people view God sort of like the referee at a big-time WWE or whatever they're called, pro wrestling tournaments. Have you ever watched one of those? I don't usually watch them because I've heard they may not be real. But, um, but anyhow, there's a referee in there. And the referee is everybody's version of God. The referee is watching two people hit each other with chairs. Apparently, that must be in the rules. And you hit each other with chairs and squirts of ketchup's going everywhere. And this referee's kind of running around in a circle, just getting dizzy, and, and he's having no impact. He's counting. He counts to three many times and even slaps the floor, but nothing happens. And, and he keeps running around and counting more and more. And then he points to the guy over there while he's ignoring what's going on over here. And... And a lot of people see God that way. They look at God as though, you know, he's just kind of, I know he's there. I know he has something to do with things, but he's really kind of meaningless and useless. Well, I want to tell you, God does deal with this stuff. And maybe we're lucky that he doesn't deal with it at the moment when he probably would like to and when we deserve it. Maybe his long suffering <laughs> toward us, his peace and his grace is a very, very good thing. How does God deal with this? Well, you know, he deals with it for unbelievers. You know, that's what you and I would want to think is that, yeah, get the heathen, zap them, God. You know, just show them who you really are. That would be great. But he also deals with the believers who are very defiant, and the scriptures are full of that. Let me show you something just for fun. If you're under the age of 20, you don't want to hear this. Deuteronomy 21. This is exciting. I don't mind reading it because I'm old and I'm a parent, so that this is good news to me. There is a day I probably wouldn't have liked this either. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 21, and it's going to remind us of the fifth commandment. If there were ten, there had to be a fifth one. The fifth one is the one that says, you know what, you ought to do good things and respect and honor your mom and your dad. Right? That's the one we remember. Okay, everybody under 20 is saying, oh, no, not this. Okay, verse 18 in chapter 21 of Deuteronomy. If a man, could be a woman, that's generic, proper English. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, it could be a daughter, who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them when they discipline him, his father and mother shall take hold of him. No direction as to how to do that. Um, shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of the town. And that's how they used to settle. That was sort of like a legal system for them. And they shall say to the elders, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a profligate and a drunkard. Now, I don't know what all that means, but it just means he's really bad. He's really rebellious, doing terrible things. Verse 21 says, Then all the men of his town shall stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. All Israel will hear of it and be afraid. Now the thing that you really want to catch in that as far as how does that match me today is that last phrase there in verse, or that middle phrase in verse 21 where it says you must purge the evil from among you. That's the whole point of God. Now, Thankfully, 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 we don't practice that today. <laughs> that was the Old Testament law. We're under grace, New Testament, all that kind of stuff. That's good news because I don't want to hear people in the church saying, oh, yeah, you know, I told Johnny to put his dishes in the, in the dishwasher. He didn't do it, so we took them out back and stoned them. No, that's not what happens. I, I don't need to do that many funerals. But um, what it means is this kid... I, I'm convinced the parents tried, and then they tried, and then they tried, and the kid became more trying and trying and trying. 
and it just got really bad. He defied all of their authority. He refused to cooperate, and he just lived righteously. Now, unfortunately, we can go all through town and find many, many homes that can be described that way. There are lots of people who today are living riotously and in absolute rebellion and against the authority of their parents, and they are doing nothing more than destroying their lives and breaking to pieces the hearts of those who love them. And teachers and pastors and judges cannot do the job of parents. They can't do it. I do a lot of stuff at the school. And we get so frustrated at times because we have great things that we want to do for kids and it all melts down with uncooperative parents. <laughs> and, and I think it kind of got to the point, at least for a while, where at least the one committee I was working with said, you know what, we need to just totally bypass. We've lost the parents. They're useless. They're no good anymore. Let's just try to change this group of kids and hope that we don't have to repeat it. That's a huge battle. I, I don't want to be in on that one with them forever. That is very, very difficult to do. <clears throat> to deal with a defiant heart is not a fun thing. It's a very hard thing to have to work with. God's had to work with that for centuries with us, with people like us, with people who preceded us. I want to tell you the uh, story about someone with a, a very, very defiant heart and this is going to be unusual because we don't think of this guy from scripture as being a defiant person we think of all the greatness of who he is but this is found in first kings chapter 11 it's the epitome of defiance and the reason why i call it the epitome of defiance is because he had the epitome of all the right and great things he had everything absolutely going right for him he had no reason to be defiant whatsoever. No reason to rebel. His name was Solomon. He was a king. He was in the middle ages of his life. Uh, he was considered, and probably still considered, maybe, just maybe, the richest man who has ever lived on the face of the earth. Very possible. Riches. Boy, if that's what you want, then, then Solomon's your idol. That's who you want a poster of in your room is a poster of King Solomon because he had it all. He owned all the kingdoms. And as you read through some of the, uh, the accounts historically, you find that uh, kings and queens of other lands were just giving him millions of dollars worth of gold and, and rubies and all kinds of stuff. And they would just give him hundreds and thousands of uh, livestock. And, and just because he was so great, he had it pretty good. He also was the wisest man other than Jesus who has ever lived. He's the wisest man who's ever lived. In fact, there are stories of noble people who have come far and wide to come and see him and just to sit and talk to him. The queen who was from Sheba uh, did that and she gave, as a result, she said, man, your reputation doesn't even touch how wise you are. And then she's com commending everybody and saying, what a thrill and a privilege it must be for the servants in this place to just be around you, to hear the wisdom. He was just by far the, the wisest person who had ever lived. He was the most powerful, maybe one of the most powerful kings who have ever lived. I mean, he just had it all. And right there in the middle of his life, right when he was at the pinnacle of success, it seems, it, it sort of seems like overnight he changed. For some reason, all of a sudden, things weren't the way it was. Uh, it probably was not quite that sudden. I want to look at just a couple things. First thing we're going to think about is the seeds of his defiance. What caused him to do that? The first thing that caused him to be defiant was compromise. Now, I'm just going to uh, tell you a little bit of what happened. In 1 Kings chapter 3, I know I told you it's chapter 11, and that's where we're going to be. But listen to verse 1. Solomon, in chapter 3, verse 1, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. Okay, here we go. We're slipping and sliding down that slope all of a sudden. That's not good. Solomon marries the daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt. And you say, well, that's 
that's not bad. I've seen pictures of them. They look pretty nice, you know, and, and Egypt's a good, rich country. Problem is, God said, no, you don't do that. My people don't intermarry. And so you don't do that. Don't even form alliances with those kinds of people because they worship other pagan gods. And, you know, we all think this. We all think, well, no, no, I can get into this relationship because I'll be the good influence. You see, I'll influence them in a good way. They're not going to touch me in a bad way. I could give you lots of illustrations of names people you know. <laughs> uh, who it's, And probably that has happened. I like to think I've influenced positively a lot of people, or some people at least, or maybe one or two, um, and hopefully they haven't um, messed me up too badly uh, or any worse than I was. But I can name a lot of people who think, well, I'm going to go back into the drug culture and win my friends for Christ, and guess what? Next thing you know, they're in trouble for what they're doing. That whole area of compromise is a killer. Another thing that's, that caused Solomon to go down is just that area of extravagance. He lived in luxury and excess. And you know what happens when people do that? Modern day athletes, they get pretty much used to that. We're using the phrase today, which is kind of interesting. It's the phrase, the word entitlement. Um, people expect things like that. LeBron James just, you know, he's going to sign in, what, another week or so, a couple more days, and $80 million. He's already got $90 million from Nike or Reebok or whoever it was. Now he's going to get another $80 million. And um, one guy was telling the other day on the radio that he was, uh, he works, this guy's a waiter at a restaurant, and LeBron James happened to be there one time and had a $60 tab. Now, I don't know if he had 20 friends with him or if that's all he was eating, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I've ever had a $60 meal. But he had a $60 meal. But the best part was he tipped the guy $100. Uh, that was a 140% increase on the, uh, everybody. Now, when you go to the restaurant today, you don't have to do that. But extravagance and excess. And, and I think LeBron James is okay so far. But let's see what he's like 10 years from now or 20 years from now when he's had that kind of entitlement where, you know, Manny Ramirez, remember when Terry Pluto was telling us, that he would cash his check, and what's his checks? You know, it's like 500000 in a check. So he would cash it in an envelope and put it in his glove compartment and then tell the clubby, why don't you go down to the subway and buy me a meatball sandwich? Well, what am I going to pay for? There's money in the glove compartment. Take what you need, you know? And he just, that's the way he lived his life. They don't know any better. Extravagance and excess. And then you begin to just kind of expect and demand unaccountability you're the king of the most powerful dynasty on earth at the moment who's your boss who, who are you going to be accountable to he's above it all even though he he was you know given all this wisdom he still saw himself above everything else he had good advice godly advice but ultimately he even ignored what God was saying for him to do. I'm going to go back to chapter 11 in 1 Kings and tell you a little bit about the story. And this thing is so rich. You've got to read through this uh, this afternoon. We're not going to read everything. Look at verses 1 and 2. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Now, just a little, just seconds ago, he married Pharaoh's daughter. Now, all of a sudden, he's got lots of women he loves and, and not just her. Okay, did, did, did he be the positive influence? Maybe not. There were Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, Hittites, all of them. All the ites were there. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites. Here's what he told them. You must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Bad influences. Not who you ought to be around. And, you know, it's one thing if somebody kind of, um, you know, if you have a bad influence in your life who makes you start pulling pranks, like you put flour in people's hair, baking flour when they're sleeping, or if they shoot spitballs at cars when they're driving by, that's bad enough. That That's bad. But when you have somebody who's going to influence you negatively and take you away from the thing that is eternal, the thing that lasts forever, 
the thing that is all that we are here about. And they're pulling you away from God, and they're pulling you away from your destiny for life and for eternity, then I think you've got more problems than flour and spitballs and whatever else you can come up with. Here's Solomon chasing after women that he's already been told not to. The wisest man in the world, the richest man in the world, the most powerful man in the world, all of a sudden, I don't know, did he get bored with God? Did he get bored with life? Now he's going after things. And you know what? It bore fruit. And the fruit of his defiance was unchecked independence. He was, there was nobody who could say to the king, you're really screwing this up. You're really messing up big time. You better get your act together. He willfully disobeyed God, and that is defiance of the highest degree. Some of the words here in the scriptures, as we read on, look at verse 4, and then I'm going to read verse 6. Verse 4 says, As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He turned off to spiritual things, and he polluted his mind. So, how does God respond to all that? Well, there's some strong statements. Look at verses 9 through 11. The Lord became angry angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. God appeared to him twice, and he still turned away. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude, this is your defiance, this is your rebellion, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Done. You're over with, Solomon. That's it. It's over. Strong statement of divine anger. Now, you can go to a church anywhere you want in this country, in, in any town in this country. You can go to church after church after church, and you're going to hear lots of great stories about the love of God and how kind he is, and how merciful, and how he's gonna, everything's going to be okay. And you can hear that. Go right ahead. You can listen to that. And I do believe in the love of God. I do believe in the mercy of God. I believe in the grace of God. And he is so loving, so merciful, so gracious. But I also believe he is holy. And you know what? He's angry. <laughs> he's very, very angry. Why? At me? Well, maybe, but more at my sin. Maybe he's angry because he's holy and I am not. And he's so angry that he even sent his own son, Jesus, to come down and to take care of the issue. Get something done about this. Do something because my anger is so strong at this that it's got to be dealt with. And so he did on a cross. When Jesus hung there for three hours, God poured out all of his wrath, all of his anger. He took out all of your and my defiance and rebellion and placed it there, and he beat it up, beat it to death. And then he gave Jesus life again. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, uh, there's a word that's usually when the word anger with God appears in the Old Testament, very often there's another word that goes with it. There's a word that we translate, at least King James translates it, kindled. It says that his, it kindled his anger, or his anger was kindled to a degree, or whatever. In the English, we use that word often. You know, I'll, I'll maybe put a fire out, and we're going to roast hot dogs, and Anne might say to me, well, you need to kindle that fire a little bit. That means I need to stir it or arouse it to some degree. One uh, lexicon, one dictionary in the Hebrew said there's just a little bit more to it than that. Yes, it's stirring, and yes, it's arousing, but when it's used in the Hebrew with the word and, and about God's anger, it's stirring and arousing to a much greater degree and actually literally means to be heated to the point of vexation. <laughs> now, I don't know that I understand all about the word vexation, but I have a funny feeling that means that God's really, really angry, really, really angry. 
And whatever this sin of mine is, and whatever the sin of yours is, and this rebellion and defiance, just like Solomon, who had it all, and if he could fail, then I have a funny feeling you, of, uh, you and I, who don't have a whole lot, can fail too. We don't have a lot going for us. We can fail easily. And when we do, it arouses and stirs to the point of vexation the anger of God. So angry that he even let his son take the blunt of that for us. Is God a patient God? Yes, of course he is. Is he a loving God? Of course he is. Is he a merciful God? Yes, yes, yes he is. But he is holy and he is jealous. And he's jealous of the idols of our lives. I don't have a lot of wives. I don't know Pharaoh or his wife. Uh, don't know those people. Don't have them. But you and I carry a lot of idols that we put. And an idol is anything that stands between God and us. Anything that you place between God and yourself is an idol. In verse 11, he said that he's going to tear the kingdom away from Solomon. He's going to just tear it away. In verses 12 and 13, he shows more mercy. It says this, Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son, though. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. God said, you know what? I made a promise. I'm going to keep that promise. I, I'm judging you. I'm going to put this on your account. You're going to pay for this, but I'm going to do it this way. Now, you could say, boy, Solomon got off easy. I don't think he did. That's his son. That's the kingdom. That's his reputation. That's his legacy. In sports, they talk about what's your legacy? You know, what's Michael Jordan's legacy? And, and, and people want to leave the right image of who they are and, and in their craft. And Solomon wanted to do that too. Solomon ached for his son who was going to take over and lost that. But God showed mercy. And God did something unusual. I'm not going to go to the whole story and read all this to you, but it's really fun. From verse 14 onward, God raises up some adversaries. And these are people that uh, one's named Hadad and the other's named Rezan. And these are people that were enemies of King David. And King David took care of them, sort of, and and put them in their place. And they um, they were beaten down. Um, but there were just little minor problems. Like in Hadad's situation, uh, David was told to go out and wipe out all the, uh, the pagan enemy in this town. And he did. He got everybody except for Hadad and a couple other people who escaped. And you know what? If you don't thoroughly purge what God tells you to thoroughly purge, it's going to come back and haunt you. It's going to come back at a time when you don't want it to come back. And sure enough, Solomon raises up at the end and here comes Hadad, and here comes Rezan. And they both have waited patiently. Their anger kindled against Solomon because of his father David. They hated Israel. They hated everything that stood for, and they waited in the shadows. And, and God allowed them to, to prosper too. Rezan actually was in the courts of Pharaoh, and, and then at the right moment was able to say, I'm going over there. I'm going to go attack them. And they all had influence. Everything just worked together. And you know what? They even remembered. They remembered the stories of what happened to them in the past. Solomon probably knew nothing about Hadad, may not have known anything about Rezan, but those guys remembered him and his family, and they were ready. Then comes Operation Revenge. Look at verse 25. Boy, we really skipped a lot in chapter 11. Verse 25 says this. Rezan was Israel's adversary as long as Solomon lived, adding to the trouble already caused by Hadad. So Rezan ruled in Aram and was hostile toward Israel. Solomon probably didn't even know their names, didn't know anything about their stories, didn't know anything of them, and they just waited and waited and waited, and they were able to bring their revenge, and they became a burr in the saddle of Solomon. They were hostile toward him as long as he lived. And I can imagine that at some point Solomon would have said, who are these guys? What are they doing to me? Why is this happening to me? Well, the reason why Solomon is is because, first of all, your father didn't completely purge the way he was commanded to do, and you defied God as well. And when you defy God, God is going to get 
even with you. When we're defiant to God, He simply calls the things that are already there in our lives and just brings them out to attack us. That's all He has to do. He didn't have to create a new Hadad anywhere or Rezan. He just called it up and said, you know, you guys have been plotting for for decades. Your revenge against David, here's a way to do it. Solomon's being defiant to me. Go at it. Do what you want to do. Cause problems. He is persistent, God is, when dealing with defiance. In verses 26 and 28, Jeroboam is another one. He's climbing the ladder of success in the courts of Solomon. Solomon loves this guy. He's doing a great job. He's getting big time. And then all of a sudden, at some point, he rebels against the king. Proverbs 13.15 has a phrase that says this, The way of the treacherous is hard. You disobey God. You're defiant to God. There's going to be difficult circumstances that come. David, in in Psalm 32, when he was broken over his sin about what he had done to Uriah and with Bathsheba and how he violated everything God had ever set before him, he was so broken, he describes that in Psalm 34, just what it was like, and there was a physical brokenness that came with it. And he says that day and night, the heavy hand of God was on me. I just felt it. I felt all day and all night there was no relief. The stress was overwhelming. The, it, the pain and, and the discomfort was terrible. And he said, my strength was sapped within me. In verse 40 of chapter 11, uh, Solomon tries to execute Jeroboam, but he escapes and he goes down to Egypt. It just seems like when you're defiant to God, even when you do the strongest, best, wisest thing you can think of, it's not going to work. It's not happening. Well, let's look at the, the downward spiral of this defiant king. How does this happen? How do we do this? How do we get from being successful, wise, powerful, rich? How do we go from there to where we just gradually go away? God is blessed. God has appeared. God has spoken. God has commanded. How do we go from there to... All of a sudden, I'm a defiant person against God. Well, there's several things. First, it it almost always begins with a carnal attitude. A carnal attitude. Attitude is always going to precede the action. It's always going to be that way. You approach something with a very negative attitude, you're going to have a very negative outcome, possibly. You approach something with a positive attitude, you have a better chance of having a positive outcome. Some of the things that we do when we're being defiant, is we we say things like this, I want my way. Or you might say, I won't stop until I get my way. Have you ever heard anybody say these things? I don't care who it hurts. I won't listen to anyone. I don't care about the consequences. And you think, how does somebody get to that point? I've heard that several times in people who say to me, I don't care what the consequences are. I'm going to do my way. And I think, how do you get from being a balanced person who just wants to do what's right and enjoy life to the point where you're saying, I don't care what the consequences are. I don't care if I go to hell. I don't care if I end in prison. I don't care if it destroys my family. I don't care if I die of a disease. I'm going to do what I want to do. How do you get to that? Well... First, it starts with that carnal attitude. By the way, that Proverbs 13:15 has another part to that too. It starts off by saying, good understanding produces favor, but the way of the treacherous is hard. Smart, sensible, wise things bring favor. You know, when, when I act good to people and, and nice to them and kind to them, good things happen. What a coincidence. But when I'm not that way, if maybe I'm a little bit edgy or if I'm just care less to somebody, then, then things don't go quite as well. If I'm acting smart and wise and, and sensible, then favor is going to happen. But when we're treacherous, when we're defiant, when we're sin-laden, it's going to be very, very hard. Solomon will raise his hand in testimony to that. It l- leads to a personal misery. And that's what he experienced. Then another thing that happens is it results in bondage. Let me read to you from Proverbs 5. I just wanted to 
share a couple other thoughts that Solomon wrote about that. It's Proverbs 5, 21 to 23. For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. Now Solomon could say, you know what? That is absolutely true. I thought I had it all. I thought I was rich. I thought I was powerful. I thought I was wise. I knew what God wanted. In fact, he appeared to me. He told me what he wanted. I I had a relationship with God. I was on the inside. Then he said, but you know what? Everything is in full view of God. He knew my heart. The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. The cords of his sin hold him fast. He will die for lack of discipline, led astray by his own great folly. That amazes me. The cords of sin will hold him fast. Sin will wrap around him so strongly that he cannot escape. I'm fascinated by those phrases of, I want my way, I, want, I won't stop until I get my way, I don't care who it hurts, I won't listen to anyone, I don't care about the consequences. Those statements are very, very hurtful. If you've heard these words from someone before, and it's someone you care about, then I'm really sorry that you've had to hear that. And I know that had to be extremely hurtful when someone said to me, I don't care. I don't care what this does to you. I don't care how it hurts. I just want my way. I'm going to do what I want to do. That is extremely painful. And you have gone through horrible things if that's what you've had to endure. If those same words are bouncing around in your head, maybe even now, then you are in tremendous danger. And you know what? So is everyone else who cares about you. You can think that, well, it doesn't impact them. It doesn't bother them at all. It's just me. I can do what I want to do. I don't care about them. It won't hurt. It kills them. It destroys them. Just seeing you doing the wrong thing kills and destroys the heart of everybody, and they do care about you. So often we just live life, you know, just in a rote form, just going through the motions, and we think, well, it doesn't matter. They don't care that much, and they don't, you don't understand the depths of how much people care about you. And you are in great danger if those kind of thoughts are popping through your head. You need to escape from that. You need help. You need to find hope. And the hope is only in the forgiveness that comes from Jesus Christ. doesn't matter how defiant you have been. doesn't matter how rebellious you have been. doesn't matter how far down the road you've gone. Jesus Christ has paid that. God's anger has all been poured out already on the cross. Is he hurt by it? Of course he is. Or, or Paul wouldn't have told us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. We, make, we break the heart of the Holy Spirit when he sees us sinning willfully against him because he knows what Christ paid for that and he doesn't understand why we would shove that back in his face. But Christ wants to forgive you In fact, the scriptures say that God is faithful and he is just. Just means he's going to take care of the problem. He's going to do the right thing legally and every other way. He's done it through Jesus. But he's faithful. He will never fail at forgiving your sins when you come to him in repentance and confession. You need to go to Christ and say, I need you. I need you to take this away. I need you to take this away now if there's defiance in your heart. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the work of the Spirit of God and for the teaching of your Word that has told us and taught us that sin is horrible and and it just destroys us and it doesn't look good on us. Uh, And it just is painful to you. And I don't understand everything about grieving the Spirit of God, but I know that breaking your heart is a horrible thing. I don't like it when my heart's broken. And I certainly don't want to break your heart. And I know sin does it. I know it does. And and it's one thing to to do sin um, in a sense innocently. No such thing. But uh, but it's really bad when it's willful and defiant. And God, I don't know what's here in our audience. I don't even know everybody. But I know that there's probably some that are struggling and maybe just dabbling in the idea of I want my own way and I want it now. And I would just pray, God, that you would speak to them. Uh, Let them explore in your word how important it is to obey you. 
And, and I know that life goes better when we do what you want us to do, Lord. Solomon's life would have been a whole lot better if he had just stopped chasing after those carnal attitudes and just obeyed you. Lord, my life goes better when I obey you. And I pray that you would just help us to be submissive and obedient to you in everything. God, today we want to just lay our hearts before you and allow you to speak to us. And may you be the one who is honored in all of it to receive the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.